So I think we should start, right? So when we uh, conceived this symposium, we thought it would be really important to have a closing session with like a looser discussion and um, thinking about the topics that were um, like discussed in, uh, throughout the, these two days. And um, I'm very happy we did that because I really come out of this wonderful two days of um, conversation with the impression that we have like so many topics and each one of them should tra be transformed in another symposium. Um, but so um, I, I talked a little with uh, Yukio and with some other colleagues and I have like, I think I'm just gonna say some words about topics that for me seem very relevant. One of them um, is obviously um, that we have to be really attentive to chronology and that um, of course there are practices and we, we have somehow this model that is transplanted and transformed in different places but it's very curious that it, it happens not only in a very ge geographically dispersed um, space, but also in a time frame that is very different. Now, so, uh, for instance, in the panel for Latin America, I, I complete that, that came to me really clearly that we had like many papers that were dealing with a specific moment. If you, if you think, oh, it was all 19th century, but even in 19th century, the, the difference are really radical, and each moment, um, I think, poses a different challenge. And I think that that also touches um, in the question that was posed um, in this last session about um, the differences between like lands that were colonized or not colonized. Because um, in some respect, yes, that is super important. But on the other hand, colonization means so many things. And, and even lands that were not occupied <laughs> in some, in some um, dimension we're all like also, we could even say maybe economically colonized or, or there was some, there are many levels in which this, this transfer and this communication happened. And I was thinking about Brazil, which is a very typical ex-colony example. But in this context, the academy actually flourishes as like an anti-colonial institution, not in an institution, and that is the case of many countries in South America, where um, it is a form of affirmation of a national identity. So it plays, and I think it is, uh, the question is there, but it's not like black and white. Another issue that we actually did not touch, and I think is very important, and I would like to hear everyone, <laughs> maybe, or whoever wants to speak, is about the implications of our discussions for our own discipline of art history. Because um, for sure, in Brazil, <laughs> as an example, um, art history was written within the context of the academy. And um, what we do today as art history is runs from that legacy, also um, in respect of what we do not or we did not consider art for so long. So because um, our first art history book was at, actually written by the director of the academy, he reached out to specific, specific elements of colonial culture in this case, and he kind of obliterated a whole bunch of other cultural or visual cultural manifestations. And so I think the history of academy is completely linked to art history. And I think that would be very interesting to, to see how that happens in uh, different parts of the world and in which measure the discipline of art history practiced in all these countries today is or is not connected to this model. No, I think that that could be something 
also to think about. I don't know if Kiel wants uh, to. No, I just wanted to reinforce that point. It really uh, was, uh, for me, underscored by uh, Patricia, your paper, uh, and the role that it's already playing in the histori historiographical reinterpretation of the past of earlier paintings in the late 19th century. And, you know, we're still, I mean, you know, every time the, there's an Oxford or Phaidon series that comes out and it's just, it's based on nation. You know, I always think of in art history that we're trying to overcome nation. Uh, but it's not happening in East Asia. You know, it's, uh, we're still very much uh, China, Korea, and Japan, and you have these kind of vertical, vertical histories uh, that her, kind of uh, somewhat hermetically sealed vertical histories that are really, uh, in many cases, generated through the, the institution of the academy. You go back to the academy, and it has a profound footprint on this process, right? Well, I don't know. I, I would just say like one more thing, and then I, I would really lo love to. I think um, another thing that we saw that there are many differences, but I think what would be really productive is to maybe think of the academic practices as kind of reference specific modes of um, uh, um, or, or like practices that are um, around which Const different um, subjectivities and constructions happen, but at the same time, it is kind of a, a mode of um, constructing a common language because it is um, um, implemented with the academy across the world. For instance, the practice of new model, the, cop the copying of plaster casts, the hierarchy of genres, so many other practices that belong to the academy. So I think maybe a very productive way to look at this topic would be not to think about, oh, how the institution as a whole works through it, but like maybe through the specific practices of the academy and how it is adapted and re transformed in different places. I think that could be, and again, that could generate like a whole bunch of books and seminars for each one of these topics. But I think uh, in some respect, the academy, they're very different, and that, that's one thing that we have to acknowledge by listening. Uh, but, but some of these practices happen in all of them. So I think that is um, a way to approach the subject to the future, maybe. I would just like to follow up on this, and it's uh, what interest is uh, what, what my interest is in looking at um, modern modern Chinese art and other things, and which is something which is really uh, I think also shared by by the papers is what you just said about the translations and transpositions and relocations of particular institutions and models, but also practices and also the mistranslations and the misunderstandings and the new creations uh, that c come along with this. I mean, I think we had also many examples of how, uh, you know, particular practices being um, enacted in a certain place uh, just uh, transform the practice or the concept or, uh, you know, take on different meanings uh, at different times at different places, but um, make it comparable uh, in a way too, in, in a global sense, maybe. Um, well, I was trying to think about something that struck me, you know, across our three large panels, which of course are organized regionally, which I think is, you know, interesting on the one hand, but I think the next step we can sort of rethink about that. But I was thinking about the notion of anxiety and how, you know, there's the anxiety of influence, of course, but there's also this, um, and if you noticed, unlike the first and third panel, the second panel, which was the Latin American panel, pre-Hispanic artistic traditions just don't come into the picture. Um, unlike, you know, long-standing, whether it's Persian, Chinese, Indian traditions are very much set into place. But nonetheless, when the you know, academy comes into the picture, there's this sort of rejection of one's own 
tradition, whatever own tradition means, which, you know, say the Chinese case is very clear to me, unlike the pre-Hispanic case, there is a clear rupture with the, you know, um, conquest being a type of, you know, colonial model being very different, let's say, in the two cases. But nonetheless, there's always this notion of, you know, one's own tradition or the territory tradition that belongs to a specific territory and how it comes in or not into academia. In fact, I would say that our papers from the second session just didn't really deal with that, but there is some of that because they become archaeological artifacts in the 19th century and so forth. But it was just to say that I think that there's, it's striking to me and particularly hearing the last panel, that there's this pull of you know, European academic art um, and it's not just the colonial imposition, it's not just a top-down thing, but there's a real sort of pull to this, and I keep wondering what it is, you know, why it is perspective ultimately, or a type of perspective so attractive, you know, and so I think there are these sort of deep issues that I was actually thinking it would be very useful, um, and I think it's just something that Kirsten put on the table yesterday from the very start, and it's to think about theoretical models that allow us to sort of think through all of this. So I really like this idea of local history, but I think we could probably, you know, it would be useful to think about mm -hmm. um, theoretical models and maybe think about, you know, if we have a next time, um, to think about, you know, now that we can compare and contrast regionally, what happens if we flesh out these very, you know, large topics um, and then start thinking across our regions or comparatively, I don't know. So. That's what I wanted to um, say. <laughs> well, could I just follow up on that? It's such an interesting point, uh, Patricia, that you make. And you know, in the case of, of Japan, and I think to some extent uh, East Asia as a whole, uh, one of the things that is a pull, uh, in addition to the idea that, you know, generally speaking, um, the idea that the art academy is in the service of the state. It strengthens the nation state. This is a moment when nation states are emerging in the 1920th century in East Asia. But, but in addition to that, there's something, inex there's something kind of ineffable about the power of the art academy, which is the value, and Sanal and I have, have talked about this a little bit, the, the values that are propagated successfully in society by an art academy in an early modern European context. I say especially, maybe it's not, I shouldn't say especially, but for me especially, the French academy. And it's not just what goes on in the academy, a pedagogical model, or even the charisma of the works that are produced by that, but the, um, the kind of embedding of the values of, of art with a you know a capital A art uh, and aesthetics through the discourses you know Diderot's <laughs> through Diderot and others the commentary this tradition of public discourse that comes out and and that's oftentimes what people are struggling to domesticate in East Asia you know the the uh, Lin Feng Mian's and, and so, you know, th this, this idea, you know, there, there are journals here and there, but it's this kind of larger kind of invisible ecosystem that generates discourse that raises the, the value of art. So, you know, um, and, and that's kind of also part of the academy. It's the discursive penumbra around the hard infrastructure of the academy that seems to me so difficult to um, conceptualize in terms of transmission. Uh, a transmission studies approach to the uh, to, to the academy would have to take into account this kind of intangible, you know, I don't know, practices of, of public discourse that, that promotes the academy. It, um, and I don't know if it's fair to say, but listening, so it seems it's piecemeal in all of the context I heard. You know, like in Latin America, I didn't get a strong sense of how exactly the idea, you know, there are some newspapers, there are individuals, there's some, but, but um, it's, not, it's not systematic. And it's certainly not, uh, I think, systematic in, in East Asia either. We're, we're still trying to kind of get at that. So um, that's one thing that really kind of uh, came to the fore, especially with your question, has, has hung over my, um, yeah, my experience of the papers as well. Well, I just want to make another comment about this. The, we started, and I, I actually started mentioning that I think thinking about the academy is paradoxically a good way to think about global art history you know, in another kind of more concrete manner. And there's something about, we, we did not touch on the fact that the academy also, 
um, um, builds bridges that are, you know, uh, that are collaborating to, for, to construct kind of a cosmopolitanism that is very modern and it is part of like world culture <laughs> that starts in the 19th century. Because many of these artists, they, we talked a lot about how things happen when, you know, they go to Europe and then they're back and what happens, but they go to Europe and they are kind of like meeting each other as well. And I think there's something about uh, the academy being like uh, connected to modern to modern life and to a cosmopolitan um, kind of uh, aspiration, you know, that comes with that, and that that is kind of in the in the beginning of what we could call like this globalized uh, cultural world that we live in. So I think this is a, a dimension that we actually didn't really touch, but thinking about that all these artists have something in common, and that is that they circulate, you know, and, and I think they, they meet each other as well, no? like Japanese artists in Jerome's studio sat side by side by the Brazilian artist and, you know, by someone from Turkey, and we, we have to imagine this dimension of the academy as well, you know, and I think that is something that could be very and interesting. Then, and then they're explore. anticipating, uh, especially from the late 19th century onward, the, those that are studying in the French <laughs> Academy especially, are uh, anticipating uh, multiple audiences at the same time, a stratigraphy of audiences that are both local and then farther away, like a Russian nested boxes structure. Um, from the late, and, and you know, Kuroda, who comes, spends 10 years in France, he's studying with Collin and Bouguereau, and he comes back, and he's an unbearable snob, probably, to his colleagues, but, but this triptych has, is shown locally, but, but he already anticipates from its outset that it's going to be shown in 1897 in Tokyo, and then 1900 in Paris, and he kind of builds that time release, multiple audience, international stratigraphy into the initial conception of the work. And that, for me, folds that cosmopolitan into the very identity of the work from the outset. So yeah, I think from a certain moment, uh, especially, it does generate a certain kind of you know, remarkable um, cosmopolitan, uh, vernacular cosmopolitan subject uh, 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 through the specific circuits of the academy and the salon. And this, you know, nexus of institutions. What I'd like to add is sort of picking up on what Patricia, I'm glad you brought up the pre-Hispanic because I just kept thinking is, I mean, we're looking at uh, Mexico, which is I think a unique case because of how early the academy is established. Uh, I read somewhere that this is the first kind of attempt at establishing a European style academy outside of Europe in the late 18th century is just going back to this question of chronology, at least for Mexico is, you know, it, it emerges towards the tail end of the colonial period and the academy is just one of many phases of Europeanization that has been taking place uh, in New Spain starting in the 1520s. And um, I, was, I was thinking during some of these questions of uh, sort of the Aztec, you just look at uh, what are incorrectly called codices you know, the emotionally, the screenfold format, book-like objects that the Mexica had, these long strips of paper that would have been folded up like accordions, and there's a flow chart kind of composition of pictographs and uh, different types of information. You know, uh, the introduction of the bound, paginated European book completely altered, you know, not just the object, but the way knowledge is processed and recorded. You know, these screen folds would have been placed, I mean, this goes back to ergonomics too and the whole phenomenological question of how these objects function uh, in relationship to the human bodies around them and how they're read. You know, these things would have probably been laid on the floor and some of them had performative aspects like the histories. Uh, the tlacuilos, who would have been the scholars, scribes, would have dressed up and performed them. They're almost like uh, 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 theatrical cues. They would perform the content you know, and, and there's no beginning or end. You can start in the middle, you can go in any direction, you know, but all of a sudden you have this European book has a beginning and an end, and it's divided by pages, and it's episodic, and it completely structures sort of movement through space and time, you know? And so that's like a major rupture right there, and from that point, we see this process of really forced Europeanization 
So uh, New Spain is pretty Europeanized. I mean, the dominant framework is Iberian, it's European, and then you have native elements, some African elements, Asian elements coming in, but they are functioning within a dominant European framework. And the academy is just one in a long, long series uh, of sort of shifts that are introduced, uh, at least from the Spanish, by the Spanish crown, uh, to kind of modify what's happening in the Americas so that it keeps up with cultural developments in Europe. And it's a very different kind of case when you look at the late 18th century in the academy. And, um, and I mean, as I mentioned in my talk, I mean, in that case, the academy is a failure. I mean, not all of these colonial implementations function. The academy is one of the better examples of something that just really didn't, it didn't take. You know, uh, the, the, the buen gusto or neoclassism just didn't speak to people. But even when the academy is established with the paintings that I showed, where you have the devotional image of the Virgin with the, the narrative episodes around her, and then when you see that reformatted into a history kind of painting format, that completely shifts the way this image is engaged. I mean, with the devotional image, you're kneeling, and it's high up, and it's probably distant and embedded in an altarpiece. There's a, a different kind of physical relationship to that image that completely gets erased again, you know, just by the shifting, reformulating, same content, but a different pictorial fr framework. That alters it yet again. You know, so I found that question about ergonomics and phenomenology to be really central, because I hadn't really thought about it too much, and so I started working on this paper. You know, but that question to me, is, personally, is probably the most interesting one, is how the introduction of these new academic models just comp And we were talking about it when you said sociability, that stuck with me. You know, that the introduction of new ways of not just teaching, but uh, of production and engagement, uh, some, some major ruptures are happening. Um, and, and they're more successful in some areas or others. In, in, in New Spain, most of the changes are seen in, in the Central Valley around the capital. In other parts of New Spain, you, you know, the, the influence of the academy is very, very, very low to non-existent. And then, especially in architecture, they're, they're imposing this new architectural idiom. And in the North, for instance, the, the, this neoclassical architectural language gets altered by Baroque elements. It's like a Baroqueized form of neoclassicism. You know, people aren't giving up the Baroque and they kind of apply what they're being told they're supposed to, but they play with it very loosely. And you wind up seeing these kind of like almost hybrid kind of negotiated visual languages that really aren't reflecting what the academy's promoting. I mean, so it's very inconsistent, you know, uh, but in any case, that was just what I wanted to add. I have to say that uh, for 19th century Havana, it, it's tempting to try and think about how we might map uh, the academy as a social formation, like an interspatial kind of network of, of, of um, things that are happening. I mean, it's, it's more than just for me, I mean, a site of viewership or a site of uh, production. It is also this kind of, um, you know, network of spaces in which academic ideas are lived and performed and so on. And I mean, it almost begs, you know, the creation of a GIS system or something to kind of like historically pinpoint the different locations. I mean, you talk about monuments and urban spaces, but also theaters and places that then can be mapped to literatures. You know, for example, newspapers that um, are almost in real time unfolding the academic or the, you know, academically sanctioned or authorized uh, things that are being produced, for example, a new theater or a new monument, and talking about what they, what they exhibit, what kinds of values they exhibit. And you also have novels and you have you know, a richness of 19th century sources that I think could be used to sort of map this performativity of the academy, in a sense. So the question is, what is the academy? And I mean, is it just a sort of site or is it this kind of cultural socio-cultural formation that, that you know, uh, I mean, one of the, a few things have come up throughout the course of this discussion, you know, the relationship between uh, academic formations and religion, you know, is it kind of, it reminds me of Alfred Gell's, you know, expression, the cult of art or something. Um, and then uh, this interspatiality and this phenomenology that's been mentioned. Um, it just seems like an, it, it, Havana seems to sort of beg uh, some, some kind of approach like that, in, at least in one way. Um, I, yeah, I just wanted to echo your, this um, concept of performativity 
in the in the academy because you know I'm talking about entrepreneurial establishments that really count on very much on public uh, media coverage and everything, right? And if you see the sort of uh, photographs that uh, you reminded me of the, the the positioning of these souvenir photographs, right? Speak very much to the publicity uh, of of the of the academy, right? Um, the other thing is, you know, if you actually read uh, a period uh, journals, they discuss painting as an extremely learnable skill. The more you put time, the more you draw, the more you practice doing these academic trainings, the better a painter you are. Talent never came into the practice because that would je jeopardize the existence of academy. So you see this whole, you know, writer would uh, corroborate in this whole effort of establishing, you know, the, the very social existence, the, uh, the gravitas of, 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 of the academy and expanding its influence to other spheres, uh, uh, so on and so forth. So I, I think the performativity and you can have a whole, I guess, uh, discussion on how, you know, uh, that was carried out in all these different uh, uh, contexts. Um, Claudia asks, uh, what do we do as art history? Um, and I'm not an art historian, so I don't feel like I can participate in that, but I can, I, I'm, I really can pick up on where the conversation's going now with Paul and Ren and this issue of performativity. Um, thinking with the Lebanese case, the French would not allow an academy because an academy was supposed to be an expression of French being and distinction and difference, and Lebanese as Semites could not rise to that. And yet, um, what all the other papers show is that the academy is always a production of society at national or individual. And even, Ren, when you're talking about the expression of a certain subjectivity, you, 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 to me, as an anthropologist, you're describing the, the cultivation, the creation of that subjectivity, like bringing it into life, because how else would it exist? Um, so it, 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 it does seem to take us back to this really interesting problem that the French were experiencing, where they needed to be distinctive, but they also needed to claim universal relevance, too. And I think that, that the academy becomes a really interesting lens on um, how art has that dual uh, capacity and uh, pr continually produces problems where people have to produce, in turn, people have to create who they are, and art really is an agent of society then. Uh, thank you. No, that's, the, I, uh, that's so interesting. Um, and this question of, uh, of the kind of creation of, a, of, of subjectivity uh, through a kind of performance is very layered in so many of the papers because a lot of the because there is actually a misalignment in many cases between academic practice and academic performance in the sense that many of the academic practices that we're talking about are first introduced through technical or military schools like De Denise uh, kind of I think shows really wonderfully in the is and and those are um, really interesting spaces where you know there are a lot of uh, uh, again, genres and practices, and you know, with of of cultural production with certain material profiles that are that are associated with academic training, but they're actually devoid of this larger kind of uh, infrastructure of, of of academic performance. They're not promulgating the values of an of an art academy because they're in something else. Um, a, a military school, a, a bureau for the investigation of, of Western writings or so forth. And so it's a very layered sequential um, kind of uh, progression towards something like a space of academic performance in many of the contexts that, I, that we're talking about, I think. Um, yeah, that, was a, that was really revelatory for me. If there's anyone who is going to sort of pick up on where Yukio um, um, was going, I'm 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 happy to 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 um, um, not continue. But but I wanted to, I wanted to actually speak to um, um, this notion of cosmopolitanism of of you know a, a, a Japanese artist um, and a Ottoman artist sitting side by side in Jerome's studio, which I think isn't as exciting an, uh, uh, a question 
um, as um, the other way around where um, you have a series of um, quote unquote European um, um, instructors who are brought in to make something of a, of a very foreign environment in which where you know in which they have to sort of promulgate academic or you know and or um, um, institutional um, uh, making of art and and or other things do you see what I mean so I, I find it more interesting when uh, a random Hungarian who's trained in um, in, in 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 an academy um, coming in to a context in, in in Istanbul and trying to you know um, um, present a, a sense of order um, um, and, and, and to, to formulate an institution, basically. Um, I, I find that more of a kind of, of an interesting, uh, a, a problematic cosmopolitanism that, that, that you know, um, that I would like to, to be able to sort of um, answer to. Um, and I think there's, there's, there's something in that, that that makes all of these academies or, or academy-like institutions across the geographies that we um, talked about um, so incredibly idiosyncratic. I think it's 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 precisely the 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 the, the notion of a top town top down institutionalization is actually never never quite there, right? Um, I I don't yeah. Okay, I think it's on now. Um, I wanted to respond maybe to what Denise was saying, but uh, a couple of things that have come up um, in the course of this roundtable, but in previous discussions as well. And as you can imagine by the um, presentation um, that I had on the strange um, career of the academy or not academy in South Asia, it's a little difficult to be optimistic uh, about uh, the formation of cosmopolitan identities in the 19th century through the institution of the art school. Um, in some ways, I'm thinking back to David's wonderful question about, well, what does the Ustad Shagird system do? And um, I think, um, Claudia, you opened the symposium by saying the academy is a conservative or understood to be a conservative but generative element. And I think in many ways, um, the academy that I'm thinking about is um, one that reifies, certainly in the 19th century, reifies class, caste, and racial difference. So uh, students from artisanal classes or backgrounds are recruited, uh, and then ideas about what um, artisans are and they do, and from certain kinds of occupations, that's absolutely kind of reinforced by the logic of the art school. At the same time, there is, I guess, a dem democratizing impulse in some ways. Um, you know, I'm not sure, again, I would call it cosmopolitan in the 19th century, but in the sense that people who are not from lineage-based um, um, families and castes can enter the profession of artist, which was not possible, say, 100 years uh, prior to that. Um, and um, the other thing I wanted, so anyway, I think that there's a really interesting question that, that David asked about, and I was thinking about the NCA in the 21st century, but that could equally be asked about what are the contradictions, but also the possibilities and limitations of uh, the colonial art school. And I don't think I would go so far as to say uh, that an imperial or colonial formation is cosmopolitan. It's certainly um, maybe transnational or cross-cultural, but I don't necessarily, um, you know, even with the theories of the w sort of wide array of theories we have at this moment about cosmopolitanism, I'm a little bit reluctant to go there with um, certainly the British um, art school. With Kalabhavan, of course, yes. I think you can start to speak about uh, a kind of cosmopolitanism that emerges. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. And the other point that I wanted to pick up on, because no one has directly mentioned it, but I think Yukio and Patricia's questions, um, really, and comments and interventions have uh, made me think about this. And maybe what you said also, Claudia, about textbooks. And in fact, the production of pasts and the production of art history hmm. as being a central goal of not just aesthetic discourses, but being a central goal of the colonial art school. So much to my um, uh, dismay and the dismay of many of my colleagues, um, students in architecture schools and art schools in India still read James Ferguson or Percy Brown. That is the textbook for the history of Indian architecture. Um, and people know John Griffith's copies of the caves at Ajanta better than they know the actual, and this is again widely known in art schools. People are copying copies of Griffiths, you know, and so on. So in many ways, um, you know, Patricia's wonderful question about Gantaran art, which I, I understood to mean a, to be a question about historiography, but you could equally understand it as a question of, you know, 
how are you teaching art history? And why copy? And why the fixation on caste? But a particular understanding um, of the past as the future of India and then reinscribed through the entire discipline of art history is almost in, in some ways more important to the so-called academy in India than it is than the production of art or artists. I think art history is, is a key concern and domain of the art school. Well, I just want to say one word about the the word <laughs> cosmopolitanism because I think that is like um, a language problem that for me because um, I I don't want to mean I didn't mean that in like a necessary positive way and I think the word what I was thinking about is more you know a fantasy of taking part in a community an international community. So it's not cosmopolitanism in the way, like the concept as like in its positive sense of someone that is, you know, kind of free from the restraints of nationality that is, I, I don't know, kind of, you know, open to the other and all that, but just the, a, a fantasy of taking part in something that is global that is being shaped in the 19th century, you know, this idea of circulation, of being a par part of something that is bigger. And of course, that for the good and for the bad. And I, we could say um, from our contemporary point of view, mostly maybe for like uh, creating a, pro a big problematic that is, is like there from that point on. So I think the word cosmopolitan is I would take it back. And I mean much more, you know, this, this fantasy of, of taking part in a bigger world and sharing that in some degree. You know? So I don't know if that helps because I agree with you. It's uh, just one, one addition. Um, Pater Mitter called it virtual cosmopolitanism, what you just described. So it's, uh, you know, that you're at the periphery, but you participate in a kind of global identity and global discourse. Yeah, it's virtual. It's not <laughs> I, I don't know if virtual is the, is the ideal word, but that's, um, I mean, that's a concept one might perhaps work with. I think the uh, well, there are several points that were made. I think that the uh, this creation of subjectivities is a great way, to, or the formation of subjectivities in the various contexts in which each one of us has explored the arrival of the academy, in light of its various complex contingencies, is a, a really productive way to think about the uh, affinities that are shared by the papers. But of course, in each instance, they're they're really quite different and those have engaged questions precisely about a historical consciousness and the ways in which the academy catalyzes a new understanding about a canon or a history. I was struck by the idea that somehow the UN period can be linked to the present day, uh, which is a, a, a question I had for you. For, well, yeah, but it's, uh, that in itself is I think quite, quite a, uh, it's an interesting position in, in thinking about a historiography. Uh, but also mediums and genres, formats, architecture, spaces, public and private. But one thing that I have been sort of thinking about, um, I don't know if any of us can answer it, but perhaps there are people in the audience who can engage this question, but it's the extent to which, you know, I was actually thinking the other morning about Abul Hassan Ghafari, and so he goes to Italy, but did he really go to the academy? I mean, or was he kind of stuck in a language translation problem, hanging out in the sort of the restaurants of Florence and maybe visiting the collections? But, but what was that really like for him? And was the presence of the Persian or any number of other visitors to Europe, in what ways did they actually contribute to this kind of master code, the master model, of the academy, was it disrupted in any way by their presence? And then a, a related to that would be, have we in fact made a caricature of the academy in our individual historical narratives? So, and then a continuation of that would be, how is it that this work uh, forces a re-understanding of the academy in the West, which is of course 
I think, something that we all secretly share as an interest. Um, I think this was tangentially brought out by several of your papers, for example, David, and the relationship between the Department of Chemistry and the Academy of Photography and, and military draftsmanship and um, technical study. But um, of course, the or and, and this has come out and, and kind of alluding to questions of the productions of knowledge, but the origins of the Academy in, in the 17th and 18th century are very much tied to the Academy of Sciences and so many of the instructors there were deeply connected to um, experimentations in the sciences, experimentation, ideas of what experimentation is. Drawing was really developed so that you could really um, pursue experimentation and pursue you know, natural philosophy, what we might call the sciences now. And there was such a strong relationship between the advancement of art as a, as a means to advance technology. And I think about a lot of, I mean, Diderot's project, which is really the last perhaps encyclopedic project dedicated to these art de métier and really looking at um, technological exchanges that were happening. And so just, um, it's been touched on a little bit in, in many of these papers, but thinking about the ways in which um, in the West, the origins of the cat academy really are about the production of knowledge and, and in many ways the arts were in fact a, a handmaiden to actually furthering the sciences and furthering experimentation within the sciences. Um, so, so maybe th just offering that, that out as, as, a, as a question. Well, I want to say a quick thing about that. That's just came to me when we were like in the gallery that actually, you know, we say the academy, but <laughs> like if you just look at what, yeah, what happens to like the French academy in the span of like two like centuries, it, it's a completely different um, um, institution in various moments every like three decades, it's something completely other, with a new project. And so we are, we are, I think you, you have a good point there that we fetishize that somehow, like that we, we see it as a fixed point of reference, which is it, basically it's not. So we have to actually deal with that. And then I think your question has a lot to do with that because it depends on where you are. Um, for instance, for the beginnings of the Academy in Brazil, actually it was founded to be an Academy of Art and Sciences, and that was really important. And if you go like 50 years later, there is, a, there is another institution for science. You have this separation, and it connects a lot more directly to kind of the idea of uh, art world that is contained in itself and so um, it's hard to and and then like it does connect to science but in a different way it's not that you know you're training for instance artists to do scientific expeditions as it was in the for instance in the 18th century now where with these academia de desenhos you were training artists to be scientists or to work with scientists. So it's, it's really, we have to really acknowledge that, uh, as like I said in the beginning, the, the chronology of the thing is really important in both ends. No? And so, so it's hard to, to establish like definite answers for the, these kinds of things. Yeah, and if I could just echo uh, some of what you just said, and, and Carl, what you what you've just pointed out, the the um, even if uh, two artists are studying in France in the same period, you know, they're they're under different teachers and different. Tilly is getting very different. Uh, I think we heard a little bit this morning about how Jérôme is a very different from Bouguereau or Raphael Collin, or you know, these are very different um, kind of uh, uh, regimes of instruction and. Uh, but also, well, one of the things that really struck me was the importance of the arts and crafts movement and the Kensington, proto-Kensington <coughs> model to so many of what we're, so much of what we're calling the, the art academy. Because 
of the importance of craft, and especially, you know, that's also where chronology is important, right? Where you are in the 19th century positions, so-called the utilitarian arts or crafts or industrial arts in, in different ways. And oftentimes that's, um, uh, but, but, but that too is a very constructionist notion of the utilitarian arts in any given cultural, uh, uh, cult cultural context. And so I do think we need to, you know, do the work of, I mean, the, the, it's kind of convenient just to say the, the art academy outside Europe, you know, it's kind of, more of a, as much of a provocation <laughs> of a title if you, because no one wants to hear us endlessly try to taxonomize the various different models we're trying to, you know, sort out here. But, but, I, but I do think we, we need to at least understand what some of the major meaningful models was, and, and arts and crafts is actually arguably as important as, as uh, anything else for much of the, you know, swaths of the world that we're trying to, to explore. You know, to Kara's question about um, how science is interpolated in the teaching um, of art in India, and to Yukio's point just now about South Kensington, uh, the department in South Kensington that's responsible for teacher training is a department of science and art. And uh, Arindabhata has a very um, compelling um, and provocative argument about uh, the conjunction of science and art uh, in South Kensington, as it's translated to colonial South Asia, produces a category of design, which is the foundation of the prison industrial complex. And so I didn't go there because that's a very depressing thought for all of us, but in some ways that is a kind of a dominant, if not the dominant theory of, um, which is why of course you can see I'm much less optimistic about uh, the art school as an institution, although it's profoundly generative, transformative, and uh, meaningful today. I had a, you've been uh, discussing productively and understandably these irresistible connections and contradictions across your different subjects. I, and, uh, I have a more sort of tedious topic to ask you about. wonder if anyone would be interested in taking it on. And that is uh, if anyone would, want to talk about the diff either similarities or differences in the way that all of, uh, the way of all of you are handling the materials you're dealing with. Uh, and I was struck by that, particularly in listening to Ren's talk, because, and she talked about it very nicely in the photograph of the plein air uh, sketchers with the pagoda behind them. That seems to me a very programmatic uh, photograph. And in fact, much, much as the other photographs she showed were pretty rhetorically charged about the representation of, the, of what that cohort was and what their practice was. And it made me realize that in these kinds of topics, almost always the documents, the photographs typically of these art schools are used only in the same way that we would if we had a list of who the students were or where they were, that we don't talk about the rhetoric of the documents that are, are our sources. So more broadly speaking, I'm wondering if you're interested in talking about uh, differences or similarities in the way you all are handling your materials, notwithstanding their particularities. Silent. <laughs> well, I think that um, just, uh, for sure, it was um, in the in our panel something that was evident. We had two uh, approaches that were much more institutional, and then, like Patricia and I, just chose a completely different way of approaching the topic through like one painting and one very specific issue. So, um, so as I said, I think this for me was a first like you know, coming together to just start a conversation because we didn't really frame it um, in like, okay, we are gonna go, we, we all are gonna talk about the institution or no, we are going to talk about these and these topics. I think we let, we let it really loose and people just made their options because I think this is really a first approach to a gigantic, topic that, um, and I think what we, we come out here is with, with a couple of, uh, like more than a couple, like a, a lot of topics that could be entrances, that could be 
a lot more productive in, in, in the long term um, uh, to develop collaborations than, than this first big sample of what this encounter should be. But I have to say, for me, uh, I, I learned so much and I had no idea what was going to come. This was really like, okay, let's put the cards on the table, each one talks a little bit from their perspective and, and we will start a conversation. So um, I think in that respect, we went very far and you know, we got to know each other, each other's point of reference and, and now we can actually, I think I really would love to go on um, discussing more specific uh, aspects or really t making it like the framework more tight. Now, for instance, I think perform the performativity of the academy could be a really interesting way to think about it instead of like a, an institution, but as a set of performances that transform subjectivity or like establish specific topics and themes that could, that we now see as a ways of entrance. So. Yeah, I think in my case, I mean, to this question of uh, how are you managing your materials and where, where are they taking you, you know, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's also for me a question of what forces, uh, what forces from which are the, are, are the, is the academy emanating? I mean, in the Spanish Empire, we assign a lot of agency to Madrid and to the centralized, you know, kind of uh, formation, not only of the Academy of Fine Arts, but also the Academy of History, Academy of Language, Academy of Science, and so on. So there's this presumption that it's coming, you know, from the top down, and at least in the case of Cuba, it seems to be coming from civil association that is emerging with, um, from the initiatives of sugar planters after the Haitian Revolution, who are saying, you know, we need a variety of things, this is our opportune moment, which you know, is, a, is a kind of an agenda that they have been advocating for for a century, but now is the time because the French are, you know, their sugar operation is, is done and we have the opportunity to step in. So that's really where you begin to see a kind of a mobilization and the um, economic society, as it is called, becomes a, a sort of a locus for this and later is known as the patriotic society. And it's, it's composed of Spanish administrators, but also elite clergy, uh, landowners, and so on. So one of the things I'm looking at are a series of memorias, or sort of almost like um, minutes of the society meetings. But they're more than minutes, because they're publications. They're, they're publishing these things into being, in a sense. I mean, they're publishing um, the significance of what is happening uh, in terms of uh, taste, and in terms of the academy, and so on. And then that's being echoed in the newspapers, you know. So you have to kind of read these sources against each other and, and, and begin to kind of um, understand something about where um, the initiatives are coming from. I guess that maybe that's the way I would put it. And then the, the images, of course, themselves and the stories behind those. I did talk about the documents in my paper. <laughs> and Paul had asked also yesterday for elaboration on that. Um, but there's a, there's a very interesting overlap, or the idea that the academy in Lebanon could only happen and it could only perpetuate a notion of universal art from a French model when the French were gone. They wouldn't allow it before then. And th the documents that I used are ones that I was sent to by first having done uh, what we call participant observation, field work in galleries where people were telling me, why are you here? There's no art here. You shouldn't be in Lebanon, go to New York. Um, and, uh, and so, I, this, uh, it is in the galleries that I learned to look at dossiers, press dossiers, and I became alerted a little bit to um, autobiographies of artists who wanted to prove that they'd made it. And I think part of what Farouk was doing was trying to prove that he was in the academy. So that whole story of having met the model and gotten over it is like a, a long way of saying, I really did, I really was there. <laughs> um, but it's not until like 10 years into my, or 15 years into my research that I get to the French archives in Nantes and in uh, Quai d'Orsay, and as you're suggesting, Paul, read between them, between these different, um, these different voices that were at one point in conversation and post-liberation were separated, were not heard 
to, to be there anymore. And the letter document that I showed as, uh, as part of my presentation was never shared with the Lebanese, but I actually think uh, the people who became Lebanese were already embedded in that letter in the way the um, the, the, uh, in the, cons the Conseil of Public Instruction is responding so unequivocally, like, no, you cannot have an art academy. And if we try it, this uh, Evelyn Bustros, this indigenous uh, intellectual, is going to show up and not let us do it the right way. Um, yeah. Yeah. In, in my case, uh, of course, uh, in the late 18th century, you have imperial documents, and the academy is a mechanism of, of, of the Spanish monarchy. When uh, everything's concentrated in the imperial archive, and, and everything's about uh, how can we use the academy to enforce sort of uh, new policies to meet the expectations of the Bourbon reforms. Then, of course, you have the independence movement, major rupture, uh, and then you have a hiccup for 20 years when the conservatives are in power, but then the academy becomes a tool for nation formation. You know, so then there's a shift. And how can, I mean, uh, the academy is preserved because it's, there's a lot of utility in an institution that can centralize art instruction, regulate art production, and disseminate different forms of propaganda or, 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 or content. So then the academy is kind of brought into that, that national project from a very particular political perspective. But what's different about the 19th century is that the reading, the sources become more interesting because you're not just looking at official archives, now you're looking at newspapers. You, you know, uh, their uh, gallery, their, their shows you know, the, uh, uh, their reviews of the shows. Uh, so now you're starting to get a different perspective and you can sort of compare what are the intentions uh, of the government versus what are people seeing. And this is where you start to see some discrepancies. You know, and the, the conversation gets really interesting. And for Mexico, it's not really until the 1860s that the Mexican Academy starts to fall in line with what we see happening in other academic contexts. Before that, it's, it's a completely different thing because of Mexico's unique status and history. But it's really in the 1860s then. Uh, uh, but the 19th century is much more interesting to kind of look at because you have more material. There's more diversity of sources that give you different voices, different perspectives. You know. Then in the 20th century, as, as I think uh, Yuli showed, uh, you have academies starting to propagandize, <laughs> pr promote their own words, and, and so that has to be read in a certain way. Of course, Apollo, uh, a journal which is essentially promoting the ideals of the Hangzhou Academy, sort of, although it's kind of fighting itself, at the shadow boxing with itself at the same time, uh, is, needs to be treated in a very different way. But, but, but I think it was, I, I thought there was a really rich array of kind of very archivally based, you know, kind of biographies of, of academies uh, kind of um, cross-pollinated with cases in which we actually don't have a lot of documentation. I'm, I'm not sure, David, but in your case, it seemed like actually there was a dearth of, of real institutionally generated uh, documents that would allow to tell a, a story about the birth of the uh, academy. And, and for some of us, and, and in my case, I avoided the academy altogether. <laughs> and, but, but it was... Um, but what I thought was interesting was some of us faced the problem of how to how to write the academy in the absence of a lot of a lot of material. What does it mean to read the academy? You know, reverse engineer it from the paintings that are produced therein, that are shown in the salons and and so forth. So there was a there were some real um, yeah disparities based on the contingencies of our of our case studies here. And I think one important point is also really to to look at the images or the visual productions as a, known, a, a discourse in its own, which is not directly one-to-one -one related to the text, but which has a kind, the possibility of a counter discourse or of um, different ways of um, tr maybe realizing what is uh, put out there in theory and uh, which isn't always in accord, or I mean, uh, the the Baroque and neoclassicism, a kind of controversy in in Mexico, which is kind of a failure of the academy, if I understand it correctly, and which is really interesting, right? Like the 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 society wants the the old style, doesn't want the new one, and so how those conflicts come together. I mean, that's uh, the fun part of it, I think. Thank you all so much for your sharing your work and your thoughts and
It's been a really informative uh, series of talks so far. Um, I'm a graduate student, so I want to ask a pretty selfish question about the Art History Academy. And it seems like so much of the conversation has been around the limitations of the way that art history is structured in a way that has, has forced sort of each of you to look at these issues that span nationalities and chronologies in a very specific way. And I'm curious um, to what extent any of you think that that requires us to rethink the way that the Contemporary Art History Academy is currently structured. I mean, I don't know where to begin. Uh, colonial art history is a mess. Um, because the conservatives, I mean, the Academy of San Carlos is the birthplace, the first art history written in Mexico City. It's coming out of the Academy. It's written by the, the director, whose uh, portrait I showed uh, yesterday. And uh, the, the, the historical narrative that he uses as a framework in which to insert these objects is a very particular interpretation of history. You know, it's not accurate. You know, the, the conservatives don't acknowledge the pre-Hispanic pre indigenous as having anything to do with the modern Mexican nation, so they leave it out of the conversation. They don't see it as art, which is just kind of universal at that point. It's kind of relegated to anthropology and archaeology. You know, they, they start with the conquest, and it's focused on religion. The thing is that, like, this art history is also uh, shaped by the economic status of the bankrupt government <laughs> after independence in the 1840s. Uh, as we've seen in other cases, or we see in other cases, uh, when the academy director is given the presidential order to produce a, ga a national gallery, he has no money. So he goes to the churches and the convents, okay? So that's where he gets his art, and that's the gallery. It's all religious art. They're out of like 94 pain, uh, paintings, uh, 90 are religious, four are not religious. And then he writes his history based on that, except that in his book, you'd think he could reference non-religious works, but he doesn't. It, he still focuses on religion because it kind of fits the conservative ideology of the, the church's role in Mexican society and its, and, and its utility for Mexican national identity. And that sets the pattern. Most people who you know, kind of think about what well, we today think of Spanish colonial or colonial America, think of religion. You know, think of like virgin images and saints and you know, uh, these narrative kind of images, scenes from the life of Christ. Uh, and the thing is that there was the same amount, if not more in some cases, non-religious art produced. You know, but that's not really what you think of. It's, this kind of set the canon. The canon, at least in Mexico, is very religious. And a lot of it is just circumstantial. It's based, you know, and that's what shaped at least my discipline. So one of the things that we're seeing happening today, at least for Mexico, is we're trying to break out of Mexico City. There's a whole history there of sort of a centralizing dynamic, just focused on the capital and everything else is ignored. If you go to Mexico City today, if you're from outside of Mexico City, you're from, uh, you're provincial. It is the provincia. Everything, everyone outside of Mexico City is the provincia. You know, there's still that mentality that everything, it's like a microcosm of the whole nation, and it isn't. You know, there are other art schools that no one's ever looked at. You know, it's a huge territory, and art is being produced in all the cities. So one of the trends right now is to try to, uh, to correct, you know, uh, by focusing on things that have been left out of the conversation, given the origin uh, of the field. So one thing is to look at other art schools. You know, one thing, uh, so much of the, the, the scholarship is based on 16th, 17th century. I mean, the knowledge of art history when Cotto was writing was full of gaps. They didn't know. So it's 16th, 17th century. So now people are looking at the 18th and 19th century a little bit more. You know, these are the kinds of things that are happening to try to kind of expand the conversation, you know, instead of uh, what really so many art historians have just like unreflectively just been kind of uh, recycling the same kinds of priorities, the same kinds of questions. May I? <laughs> no, I think that uh, I think that art history as a discipline in North America is doing rather well compared to other countries of the globe where there's a much greater tendency often because of historiographies or limitations or uh, constraints in language formation, for example, that uh, an emphasis has been on art history through the nation state. And there have been various kinds of projects fostered by the Getty, but also by uh, the Kunsthistorisches Institute in Florence that have tried to support these connected art histories. So putting uh, 
scholars in our history that often sit in different departments globally, not even in our history departments, into a new conversation with the idea that they can develop more expansive and self-critical views of their disciplinary practice. And then in America, of course, everything isn't perfect, but um, you know, there are certain departments where there are constraints in terms of how a field sits in a department or where a field in the discipline uh, how it occupies a department, uh, the kinds of constraints and the way that it's described. But oftentimes, uh, communities of art historians in those departments are engaged in cross, you know, cross field work, or there are clusters of faculty of various kinds of densities and specializations in different institutions. So, so even in the absence of uh, complete coverage with any, 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 any department, there's an opportunity to destabilize, defamiliarize uh, your sense of what the specialized field is within the discipline to engage these questions. And of course, discussions about the global have been a, a huge sort of galvanizing force in many of those debates. And the Clark has also played a really important role in facilitating and staging those conversations. And could I just add to both of those comments? I think there is um, uh, a little bit of a sense that uh, people, especially graduate students maybe now, would shy away from institutional history, especially the academy. I mean, you know, I, I don't think it's that bad now, but there was a moment 15 or 20 years ago where, you know, you're, a certain introduction to the history of art in North America would be uh, would unfold according to works that were the antithesis of or reacted to uh, the academy. So it became this kind of weird empty center of the art history uh, discipline. And so, um, you know, we were very conscious, I think, when we organized this, that, you know, this wasn't something that would uh, be of obvious uh, interest to to graduate students, you know, it wasn't an object that we were giving agency to and just plowing through its context, uh, kind of, you know, leaving bodies strewn left and left and right. Like sometimes, I think most, you know, most, most kind of art history that most people want to write nowadays. But, but it's, um, it's, it's, uh, but it, requ you know, it requires um, um, a certain. I, I do think it requires a certain theoretical and methodological uh, uh, set of of tools and kind of dispositions that we need to develop a little bit more in the current, uh, you know, state of the discipline uh, in North America, yeah. And I, yeah, so I think, you know, that was a wonderful question and this is a wonderful discussion, uh, kind of note to, to ponder while we bring this uh, session to a close. So as actually as a co-organizer, I, I think I should, I'd like to thank the, the Clark Art Institute and, and uh, Caroline, um, all of our uh, speakers and moderators, a uh, pretty remarkable group, and also all of you in the audience. We really felt that we, you engaged us and were part of this kind of, um, the community of this gathering too. So, so thank you very much. <laughs>